This is a meme. This is also a meme. And so is this. And all of these. The definition of the meme is constantly evolving. This much we know. The coining of the term meme is credited to an evolutionary biologist named Richard Dawkins, who used the term in his book The Selfish Gene, which was first published in 1976. In the book he uses the term to describe a unit of culture that is passed on through non-genetic means. The word has been adopted as a way to describe digital media such as images, videos, audio, text, or language that is easily shared online by internet users, often gaining popularity within message board groups before becoming more widely spread. Widely dispersed memes can start off as one particular type of media and subject before mutating into a wide variety of variations on this original. But how does a meme start? How does it become so widely distributed? And how is this helpful to modern day publishers? Hopefully this tutorial and associated case studies will help answer some of these questions. Tutorial Step 1 Decide on a format Memes come in all shapes, sizes and formats. Pretty much anything that you can post online can become a meme even stories or conversations. For this tutorial, let's make choosing a format simple and focus on the image file, i.e. GIFs or JPEGs. A decade ago in 2007, Eric Nakagawa reportedly grabbed a picture of a crazed yet strangely articulate looking cat from a Russian pet food website and added the text Icon has cheeseburger in the space above it using a typeface common to most computers called Impact. This one post went on to launch a whole genre of memes that would come to be known as lolcats. Posting this single image on the community website Something Awful proved fortuitous for Nakagawa. He quickly developed an independent website to house the many lolcat images that were being produced. The Icon Has Cheeseburger website became an overnight sensation attracting one and a half million visitors a day at its peak. The site featured a LOL builder that allowed visitors to select a preset image and add their own text over the top. This led the LOLcat genre to spawn its own unique take on the English language known as LOL speak. Icon has cheeseburger is proof that you don't need complex source material when choosing the content of your meme. You don't even need to use any fancy formats, although you still can if you like. An image grabbed from a website with two short lines of cheeky misspelt text in a preloaded font could be enough. As a side note, it's probably best to avoid copyrighted images if you can help it, although there are plenty of popular memes that don't. Some even include copyright watermarks over the top of images directly acknowledging their source material. Step 2. Create access points. Memes often start their lives as posts within online community forums hosted by sites such as 4chan and Reddit to name but a couple. It's in these forums that the germ of an idea can be expanded upon through the group effort of its members before finding its way into the wider realm. The 11B times 1371 meme emerged in the form of a spooky video that contained puzzles for viewers to decode. This video was quietly uploaded to YouTube in May 2015, but it wasn't until October when the original creator of the video posted a copy on DVD to a tech blog called Gadget ZZ that it started to spread. Reddit users began to analyze the video, sharing their findings with one another through the slash r slash creepy thread, generating 2,200 comments on the video within the space of a week. Reddit users employed a vast array of diverse techniques to unlock the various hidden messages within the video. One user analyzed the audio using a spectrographic technique, which created visual patterns out of sound 
hidden messages and texts were found. Another user broke down the title of the video, which appeared as a string of zeros and ones, and found clues there. Another user managed to locate where the video was filmed using Google image searches to match the house in the film with similar images online. These are all ways in or access points that the originator of this meme created intentionally. So your meme can be as simple as I can have cheeseburger or as complex as 11B times 137. As long as there is a way in for others to interact with your content, your meme should be fine. Step 3. Set your meme free. Traditional media such as books, magazines and newspapers all rely on ideas of ownership. They all contain the names of editors, authors, publishers and other members of staff. Memes do not. Like information, memes also want to be free. The copy pasta genre of internet memes is a great example of this. Copy pastas are bytes of text easily copied and pasted, hence the name, into community boards, messaging apps, Twitter feeds, or anywhere that utilizes text as a core part of the interface. The more widely disseminated copy pastas in recent times have also incorporated emojis into their text, such as the clap emoji meme, which takes new or copied and pasted text and inserts hand claps between the words for added emphasis. Whereas short copy pastas are ideal for sharing via Twitter or via text message, a subgenre emerged via message boards that revolved around storytelling. Creepy pastas are like campfire stories about ghosts and ghouls created to send chills down the reader's collective spines. The more successful creepy pastas spawn genres of their own. US cable channel Sci-Fi has picked up on the popularity of creepy pastas with their drama series Channel Zero, taking stories that have become well known within creepy pastas communities and presenting these original stories to a much wider audience. So to recap, once you have created your meme and the access points to let others in, the next step is to put it somewhere online that others can access and try not to be too precious about what happens to it. The less precious you are, the more likely it will be picked up and spread online. Step 4. Don't panic. Pepe. Illustrator Matt Fury's anthropomorphic frog started life as a carefree kind of guy who just happened to like pulling his pants all the way down when he went to the toilet to somehow ending up branded a hate symbol and is currently listed in the Anti-Defamation League's hate symbols database. Fury has followed his character's journey from comic book to 4chan icon to hate symbol and has spent the past few years trying to wrestle back control of Pepe. At one stage he tried killing him off to try and halt Pepe's popularity amongst alt-right trolls. When that didn't work, he set up a campaign to save Pepe via Kickstarter. This project is an effort to re-rebrand Pepe the Frog as a symbol of love, peace and acceptance. Recent reports suggest that he has resorted to aggressively enforcing his intellectual property in order to regain control of his creation. Especially after the release of an alt-right children's book entitled The Adventures of Pepe and Pede, which used a redrawn likeness of this character to peddle Islamophobic messages. Pepe is a worst case scenario whereby a perfectly innocent piece of artwork was co-opted and claimed by an aggressive online community that has refused to let it go. Yet Pepe is also an example of the universality of the meme as a conduit for publishing. As Reddit user Endless Orca said in response to another user asking, how many Pepes are there in the world? They replied, rule 66 is, there are uncountable numbers of Pepes in the world. Rule 35 is, there is a Pepe for everything. Pepe also shows us that there is no need to panic if your meme starts mutating in ways you couldn't foresee, because there's always change and it can always change again in the future. So the good news. Publishers, don't be distracted by that old death of print chestnut. 
Sure, print media is diminishing in terms of physical products such as books, magazines and newspapers, but these are incredibly static methods of distribution compared to the energetic way memes spread throughout the online world, and bleed into traditional media too. Mimetic dispersion also means that what might start off as a short and simple piece of easily distributed media could lead to the creation of a whole new language, a binge-watchable drama series, or a canon of images eagerly discussed by news media and academics alike, or even a regular print publication. If you have watched this video until the end and found it useful, Please let me know by leaving a comment or a like below. Thanks for stopping by. Everything's Alright Forever is a project by Michael Boykowski, produced as part of the Design Writing and Curating MA at Design Academy Eindhoven. Designed and produced in 2017, ResCat is a design research archive under construction forever. Thanks for participating.